So good morning everybody, um, and it really does give me great pleasure to have been asked to introduce our next speaker, who actually probably doesn't need introduction, as people always say on these occasions, to, to many people here will already know Sister Magdalene, but for those of you who don't, she's a member of our community in Cambridge, she's currently working for a doctorate in the theology of St Thomas um, from the Angelicum, she's also lecturing in Oxford and at Allen Hall Seminary in London and at Margaret Beaufort in Cambridge and probably various other places as well that I've forgotten, it's kind of hard to keep up, she's so fantastically busy and very much in, in demand so we're very pleased to have her speaking this morning um, and I'm sure it will follow on beautifully from uh, the, the talk that I very sadly had to miss last night. Rob's general introduction to the to the virtues, uh, and this is going to be focusing specifically on the cardinal virtues. So I leave you in Sister Magdalene's very capable hands, and we look forward to hearing what she has to say. Thank you. Thank you. If you don't mind, on your handout, I have a little prayer uh, from from the Concilium Mitri, written by Saint Thomas. Perhaps we could just start with that. In the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Whatever is pleasing to you, O merciful God, may our hearts be desired, wisely pursued, truly recognized, and bring to perfect completion, to the praise and glory of your name. Amen. Our Lady Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so obviously covering the cardinal virtues to any degree in less than an hour is a mammoth task. Um, I'm also well aware that many of you, if not all of you, have already studied the virtues. So this may be a bit of more of a review in some ways, but hopefully we can also take this as an opportunity to ponder the relevance of the cardinal virtues in our own lives as Catholic Christians and as Dominicans on our way to God, as Augustine says in our rule. Of course, union with God is only actually affected by way of the theological virtues, the topic of the, tomorrow's talk. Um, nevertheless, the carnal virtues are foundational for day-to-day -day right living, since any authentic spiritual life really cannot be separated from the moral life. Now, when Aquinas begins speaking then about how to obtain perfect and lasting happiness or beatitude, he says that since beatitude is to be gained by means of certain acts, we must consider human acts in order to know by what acts we may obtain beatitude or by what acts we are prevented from obtaining it. That is, our actions make us the kind of person that we are. So virtues change us for the better, whereas vices change us for the worse. With regard to virtue, Aquinas cites this phrase from Aristotle, Virtue is that which makes its possessor good, and his work good likewise. That is, human virtue, of which we are speaking now, is that which makes the person good, right? and it changes us. But what is the good? He says there on point two of your handout, One's good is to be in accordance with reason, Therefore, it belongs to human virtue to make one good, which is to make his work accord with reason. That is what is reasonable, rational, because we are rational animals, right? As Aquinas cites Aristotle in saying. So this happens in three ways. First, by rectifying reason itself, which is done by the intellectual virtues, and particularly of prudence as an intellectual virtue. Secondly, by establishing the rectitude of reason in human affairs, and this belongs to the virtue of justice. Thirdly, by removing any obstacles to the establishment of this rectitude, that is, in our daily life, in dealing with others, what are some of the obstacles, which often are different emotional responses that are inadequate or, or disordered. And for that reason, we have the virtues of fortitude and temperance to help us that we'll get to later. So what is a cardinal virtue then? Um, point three there, you have the cardinal comes from the Latin word cardo, which means hinge. So Aquinas says that those virtues are said to be cardinal or principal, which have a foremost claim 
to that which belongs to virtues in common. And we'll see there are many other virtues, that all of them, that he groups, except for the theological ones, that he groups under um, these car four cardinal virtues. Uh, so the role of the cardinal virtues is to rectify, that is to straighten out our reason and our appetite, but our inclination, both our rational appetite, which is the will, which is our rational inclination toward what we perceive as good, and the sensitive appetite with all its powers and emotional responses, so that by God's grace and help we can continue to this goal of union with God. So each carnal virtue then perfects a power of the soul, right? The intellect or reason, our cognitive power, is perfected by the virtue of prudence. Our will, our rational appetite, is perfected by the virtue of justice. And our sensitive appetites, insofar, I mean, they of themselves are irrational, but insofar as they're elevated by reason, they can be, uh, and are uh, also voluntary acts, because sometimes they come up and they're involuntary, but insofar as they're voluntary, they can be perfected by the virtues of fortitude and temperance. Okay, now, um, as was mentioned yesterday, there are two generic kinds of virtue that Christ talks about, acquired and infused and in point four there, you have the acquired virtue, which is gained by repetition. We repeat certain good acts, and we acquire a sort of disposition towards those acts, a certain moral constitution or character, as Father mentioned, although not one dependent on grace of itself, right? So you can have a soldier who learns fortitude by being trained for battle and becoming experienced and in fighting. Um, that does not mean he's necessarily a good person, right? He could be very intemperate, lustful, or do, or very cruel and do horrible things. Um, so that's simply an acquired virtue of, of fortitude. But a, a, or a lawmaker may become prudent by making good decisions that favor the common good of society, but he may also, uh, in his private life, have uh, be, be very immoral, right? Commit adultery or whatever. So... So acquired virtue is a sort of imperfect virtue taken by itself, Aquinas says, uh, uh, that is apart from grace. Since although it may help one consistently do a particular thing well, um, the acts of simply acquired virtue are not of themselves meritorious for heaven. Right? They are not of themselves salvific, or we would be Pelagians trying to get ourselves to heaven. Right? Now, the infused virtues, though, in point five, are directly infused by God and grace, right? Together with the theological virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Um, we receive them in seed form, generally, for example, in baptism, or if we've fallen out of grace when we get, get, come back into grace through the sacraments, uh, confession. Um, so, they, so even though they're received, though, um, they need to be, um, we need to practice them so they can continue to grow, right? So as Father mentioned, it's the, they're God working in us, but not without our consent, right? Um, so in addition, though, to this distinction of whether the virtue is simply um, naturally acquired by repetition or directly infused into our souls by God, by grace, there's another important distinction between acquired and infused virtue that has to do with the different ends of virtue, the different ends of a particular action, that is. Um, so uh, there on point six, you have a quote from Aquinas, it is evident that the acquired virtues concerning which the philosophers have spoken are only ordered to perfecting human beings in the civic life, right? In this world, in the polis, and, and not ordered as to the obtaining of celestial glory. But the carnal virtues, insofar as they are gratuitous and infused, perfect the human being in the present life as ordered to the celestial glory, right? So even though it may have a particular end of this action, you know, uh, that I need to study for an exam now, but it can, but, um, or, or, well, there are even higher things, of course, and you have, like, infused, we'll talk about fortitude, for example, the mar fortitude of the martyrs, you know, it should be ordered to celestial glory. All right, so um, he asks the question, then, are, that I think often gets overlooked, are the carnal virtues fittingly divided into social virtues, perfecting, and perfect and exemplar virtues? This is the uh, last half of page one and the top of page two. 
So he says that the exemplar of human virtue, first of all, must pre-exist in God, right? That all pure perfections are first in God as our exemplar cause. An exemplar, that model or pattern of, that in which we participate and according to which we are conformed. Okay, so he says virtue then may be considered as existing originally in God. Uh, I, I just have bits of it here. Most of it's in, in your handout there. Um, originally in God. And thus we speak of the exemplar virtues. So that in God, the divine mind itself may be called prudence, while temperance is the turning of God's gaze on himself. Why? Because he's the supreme good. I mean, he's the supreme goodness. There is no other end. Um, and even as in us, it conforms our appetite to reason. God's fortitude is his unchangeableness. His justice is the observance of the eternal law in his works. And actually, he is the eternal law. So then he says, but that's so exemplar virtue. Then he goes to social virtues. Since man by his nature is a social animal, right, from Aristotle, these virtues, insofar as they are in him according to the condition of his nature, okay, so we're talking now about acquired virtue, are called social virtues. Since it is by reason of them that man behaves well in the conduct of human affairs, um, and it is in, okay. So then he uh, he says that. Um, sorry. So then, so that's with regard to acquired. But since it behooves a man to do his utmost to strive onward, even to divine things, as even the philosopher declares in, Eth in Nicomachean Ethics, and as Scripture often admonishes us, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So notice here, he's drawing on both philosophical reason and faith in Revelation, right? Faith and reason both tell us this, uh, that we should strive onward to divine things, something higher. We must necessarily place some virtues between those social or human virtues, the acquired, and the exemplar of virtues that are divine. So these are now the infused virtues, right? And they're both of two kinds, perfecting and perfect. So he says... Virtues of some, uh, some are virtues of men who are on their way and tending towards the divine similitude or likeness. These are called the perfecting virtues, right? Those are infused by God and grace. They order us to life with God. And he gives the example, prudence by contemplating the things of God. This infused prudence counts as nothing all things of the world, directs all thoughts of the soul to God alone. Temperance, infused temperance, so far as nature allows, neglects the needs of the body. Here he's talking about mortification, like in Lent or fasting, right? Going up, not simply, you know, I'm, I'm going on a diet for my health. That would be more like acquired uh, temperance. But, but, I'm, but, I, but, but this is a more a higher thing. Um, and then fortitude uh, prevents the soul from being afraid of neglecting the body and rising to heavenly things, right? He talks about the fortitude of the martyrs that's infused. Um, justice get, consists in the soul giving a wholehearted consent to follow this way proposed. As we'll see, justice has to do with my relationships with others, uh, giving to them what's due, but also my relationship with God, right? Who, who I'm, uh, I owe everything. I owe worship and service. That's the virtue of religion, which falls under justice. So besides these, he says there are the virtues of those who have already attained. Okay, so that was the perfecting virtues on our way. But here, those who have already attained this union with God to the divine likeness, they are called perfect virtues. Thus, prudence sees naught else but the things of God. Temperance knows no earthly desires. Fortitude has no knowledge of passion. Here he's talking about disordered passion, right? Uh, um, or evil uh, as a reaction to evil. Um, justice, by imitating the divine mind, is united to it by an everlasting covenant. Such are the virtues attributed to the blessed in heaven, or even in this life, to those who are at the summit of perfection. Okay. Now, Aquinas does not think we should become Stoics. In fact, he, uh, he speaks against them. He says they were wrong, clearly. Um, but he does think that our emotional state after original sin has been disordered and needs to be rightly ordered. And the virtues are meant to help us to go to use them rightly so that we become <coughs> the more virtuous person has more passion, not less, but it's in the right way and it's motivating us, right? 
uh, towards God rather than away. So Aristotle is just giving us a baseline. But the goal, right, is God and the perfect virtue and imitation of him. Okay, so, it's a long intro. I read down potential, uh, uh, sorry, well, we look at the virtue of prudence. At point one on page two. Prudence is right reason concerning what is to be done, right? So, so reasoning rightly is key, right? Um, if I don't, <laughs> I, go, I, I, I wind up with a lax conscience or erroneous or confused or whatever it might be. Um, so what is to be done, right? Um, this is about the means to an end, the means particularly, well, not only in the practical ends of, of daily life, but also the means to the end, right? the ultimate end, union with God. Um, so practic- this is a virtue of practical reason rather than merely speculative or theoretical, because speculative or theoretical reason, uh, uh, it's good as far as it goes, right? It helps me come to the knowledge of truth. But if it just remains there, I know, but I don't act, then it's, it's not yet a true virtue. It, we need to uh, then put that truth into practice. Okay, so he says that um, prudence, uh, point two, applies then these universal principles that I know, like the Ten Commandments, the Catechism, right, that kind of thing, and applies them to particular conclusions of practical matters. That's the key, and that's something we often fail at. We often uh, get confused or, or fail to apply them sometimes because of our emotions take over, right? So I know what's right, and then I'm like, mm, I don't like that conclusion. I want to do something different. So uh, let's restart that deliberation from a different premise now until we get the conclusion that I want, right? Um, that's called rationalization. Mm-hmm. All right. So, there are three acts, then, of the reason. Okay. Um, these are uh, inquiry, counsel, deliberation, first act, judgment, second act, and then I have to command. I, that means I have to do it, the third act. And it's, it seems surprising that he considers command actually an act of the intellect or reason. Uh, we often think of it as an act of the will, but, um, but, the, but it's the reason who commands the, the intellect. It presents the good um, and and then the good, of course, has is, can choose it um, or or may fail to choose it. Um, and the, the will, of course, can also affect the intellect by saying, oh, like I said, let's restart that deliberation because that one didn't come where I wanted it to. All right. Um, so now there are different parts, uh, uh, um, uh, potential parts, and I'm doing this a little bit backwards, but I think it works because of the um, the, uh, the acts of the intellect. So we have some fancy names of these virtues that are allied with prudence, um, Greek names uh, that Aquinas just draws directly from, probably Aristotle, um, although he also draws in others. Um, uh, eubulia, that's the virtue that perfects that first act of taking counsel, right? So I may, it makes me open, docile, to receiving good counsel from another, someone that I trust or is prudent, wise, um, or, or even counseling myself, right? I, I'm thinking about what I ought to do. I'm doing the research that I need to, looking in the catechism, what the church teach? You know. um, Cynicism and nome, though, have to do with the second act of the reason, with regard to judgment, right? Cynicism, he says, is the habit of judging well according to common law in ordinary circumstances. That is, judging the means to the ends according to the true nature of things and the reality of the circumstances, really seeing the reality and the making of right judgment. That's in ordinary cases. But there's also those, those extraordinary cases that come up suddenly sometimes. Um, and then we need another virtue, nome, the habit of judging well in extraordinary matters where following common law would not lead to good action and one needs to follow higher principles. So if you think of St. Thomas More, all right, the ordinary action would be he would be obedient to the king, and he was most of the time. Um, but then in a particular case, right, where the king usurps, uh, you know, the, the role of the head of the church, and uh, he, he realizes he cannot be obedient in that case. So he needs to, uh, this is an extraordinary case, he needs the virtue of nome, as well as fortitude, to help him uh, to, to realize that he ought not to sign that oath against the truth of the faith. Um, so there are also what we call subjective parts. And, and all four cardinal, well, 
except for fortitude. Fortitude doesn't have this one, but the, uh, the cardinal virtues have these different parts. So this is the species or kinds of prudence. So you have this on um, point four. Oh, you know what? I skipped one thing, though. I should just note back to uh, uh, the um, relationship between prudence and conscience. So conscience stops at that second act, the judgment. Okay? Um, that is, um, it, it, and it could be, uh, so it's, it's judging what you ought to do, right? And you can also, conscience, unlike prudence, because prudence is a virtue, so it's always about the good, uh, conscience can be erroneous. Not uh, like, uh, you know, I, I made it, I, I, I didn't learn rightly, or I, or I made a mistake in the judgment. Um, so prudence, the judgment is, always, is correct, if it's a true prudence, where there are false friends, as we'll see. But, um, and the judgment has to be, is carried out if I'm practicing the virtue. That's the third command, right? Conscience doesn't go that far. All right. Now, subjective parts then. All right. These, are, these just have to do with the different ends of life, right? So if you look there, point four on page two. Prudence, uh, simply about my individual good, right? What, what I ought to do. Uh, and I need to study this exam, or I need to do this work. This is simple, individual, sometimes called monastic prudence. It has to do with governing oneself. Domestic prudence has to do with governing the family, or, or it could also be like a religious community. It's the common, seeking the common good. Political prudence concerns the common good of the city or state to which one belongs. Military prudence, governing the army. Um, supposedly, well, obviously, if it's pr true prudence, it must be for the common good, for the good, uh, defending against one en one's enemies. Um, and there's also a regnative prudence, the prudence of that political leader in a particular way, seeking the common, should be seeking the common good, if it's true prudence. Now, there's a whole lot, so uh, you have this on your handout. But these are what they call quasi-integral parts of prudence. Now, when he talks about that, what are integral parts? Well, he says that integral parts of a virtue are those things that are required to make the virtue, right? Without them, you don't have a perfect virtue. So, and he gives an example, like a house, the integral parts are you must have walls, a roof, and a foundation, right? They're essential to the house. You can have a wall just standing by itself, but that's not really a house. So, um, similarly, we can speak of quasi-integral parts of a virtue. They're quasi because, obviously, virtues are not material, so, um, so this is a, but it's a way of thinking of what, what components do you need to have this virtue? So um, Aquinas first divides the integral parts into two groups, right? Um, there's the, those that have to do with prudence as simply as a cognitive, his cognitive aspect. And, and then the last three has to do with that most important part, which is that command, right? So what do we need, right, if we're going to make prudent decisions? Well, we have there um, point five, um, and I just listed them out for you. I didn't give you, but if, but if anybody wants to email me, I can I can send this other stuff to you too. Um, with regard to knowledge itself, right? So we begin with some knowledge, right? We've had some experience, so we have knowledge of the past, um, my past action or past events, and I can use that to help me uh, in future to know to to help me in my decisions. So I need in memory to reflect and understand um, uh, that past action and what either went wrong or what went right. Um, and, um, and that's why actually examination of conscience at night is a good idea because not to beat myself up, but to be able to know, okay, maybe you know, that's something I, I, I kind of you know, need to do a little bit differently next time. All right, um, knowledge of the present. Um, I mean, understanding intelligence, and that means um, to be able to have a right estimate of the particular end, right? What am I actually aiming for right now? As well as that general universal principle that I need to apply to this particular situation, right? Um, you know, what teaching the church or a commandment or, or, or what, what, what is involved in this? Um, and then we have... Um, Acquiring new knowledge, because to make my decision, now this is already that first act of reason, inquiry, right, counsel, right? So I begin with baseline knowledge, but, but I need to probably acquire new. So for example, I'm discerning whether or not to enter a religious life. 
Um, I need to, uh, I, I, I have a baseline of knowledge, maybe I've seen Sisters Priest. Um, I need to acquire some new knowledge. Um, so caused by teaching, docility. I need to learn through the experience of others. Maybe I talk to a priest or a religious sister, um, or if I'm entering, you know, lay Dominicans, I talk with them, I get to know them, uh, get some counsel. Um, caused by discovery is the second part. He has a fancy name again, Greek. Eustochia, happy conjecture, of which shrewdness is a part. So um, there, I need to also discover myself, right? Uh, maybe I look online, read about you know this community, and and uh, you know, or or, or about the spirituality, to make spirituality. Okay, I need to know it. Then the second act of reason is judgment, right? Now I have to use the knowledge I've got. And here I need reasoning, right? These are the integral parts here on this side, the right side, right? So memory, understanding, docility, kind of speak shrewdness. And I need reasoning. I need to be able to perceive from those things that I know to, um, in general and, and to apply them now to this particular case. In my case, you know, will this work? All right. Um, but then, I, like I said, that only goes so far. If I just stop there, well, yeah, I think I ought to join that community. Hmm, okay. And, and not do anything else. That doesn't work because now I have to command, right? I have to go further. So first condition, foresight, providence, order that, that is the means, that, right? And, and to what is, that are fitting to that end. I have to kind of see, okay, how do I do this now? Um, second condition, circumspection. I compare the means with the circumstances. Will this fit, right? I've visited this community. I've, I've looked at Jamaican spirituality. Does this fit? Um, third condition, what obstacles are there? You know, maybe I have a temper. Maybe I need to do this or, or that. You know, things that I need to, to work on. Okay. Um, so that's, now there are various vices uh, you have there on your hand now <coughs> sins against prudence. And these sins really act against one of those virtues or prudence itself. Okay. So the one precipitation or rashness due to a lack of docility or thinking um, or lack of counsel, basically, and, and deliberation uh, is eubulia, or against, that's sinning against eubulia, right? Sinning against that. Um, or there's also a kind of thoughtlessness due to lack of caution. So maybe I've, I've gotten counsel, but now I'm not going to try to take the time to actually discern and make a right judgment. I'm just jumping in. Um, so this is a sin against either cynicists or possibly no man. Of course, with no man extraordinary cases, you often don't have much time, but you kind of rely on the Holy Spirit. Well, for all of us, we rely, but especially in some cases. But inconstancy, though, is that against that third act of reason, command, right? Here, I know what's right. I know what I ought to do, right? Um, I have already made the judgment to enter this community, um, but um, I withdraw myself from the good purpose that I've already deliberated upon and judged properly because I get scared, maybe, right? Fear, or, 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 or some other thing comes up. All right, then, now there's negligence, the privation of prudence in the sense that I just, I'm not bothered, Really, I, I don't really care that much to know or to do what is right. Um, and then there are counterfeits to prudence. Prudence of the flesh is acting for an end that is actually not good. It's actually an evil, right? Remember, for Aquinas, evil is to lack, uh, in, in a particular action or a particular case, is lacking of a good that ought to be there, right? And um, like a hole in my sock, right? <laughs> What's that hole? Well, it's, it's nothing. It's where the sock ought to be. Right. So, um, okay. So that's my hole um, in the sock. And so, sin of craftiness. Using means that are not true, but fictitious and counterfeit. Right? Uh, I may, and it could be even for a good end. Right? But I, I want to take the wrong means. Means that are, are not good. Right? And that's why um, we should, bad means never justify a good end, right? Never do evil, even in order that good may come of it, right? So that's against uh, consequentialism. <laughs> All right. And then, um, so together with that, we've seen like some of the false friends, false prudence of the sinner for an evil end. 
Um, a good robber, you could say, is a prudent robber. He's planned it out really perfectly, but um, um, that it's not a virtue. So um, worldly prudence can be directed to something good, but but it's still imperfect because it may be like he says, the prudent sailor. Okay, he did a really good job sailing the ship, but if he's not, um, you know, oriented towards God, it's just to that particular end. It's a worldly one. And then he gives, but you have this on your hand that we've talked about what true prudence and perfect prudence are, which actually is respect of the good end of a human being's whole life, right? Our final end, because we have all these intermediate ends. But they need to be ordered to that final, ultimate end, right? Which is with God. So he says there, point seven, it is requisite for prudence, which is right reason about things to be done, what I ought to do. A good, a, a, a human being needs to be well disposed with regard to the ends. But this, how do you get well disposed, right? So I don't start rationalizing, confusing myself. This depends on the uprightness of the appetite, the inclinations. That's why prudence needs moral virtue. Because moral virtue rectifies uh, right, the various appetites. And we'll talk about those three, right? Justice, fortitude, temperance. So prudence and the moral virtues have to work together because they mutually influence each other. So what is moral virtue? Moral virtue, um, there you have uh, point eight of page three. It's the habit of choosing the mean appointed by reason as a wise person would discern it. A wise person, the wisdom, ordering all things to our ultimate end. So I need to choose that mean appointed by reason. And, by, and, and the mean, of, uh, the, it's appointed by reason, that's why I need prudence so that I know what the mean is. Um, the habit of choosing the mean okay, it comes through these moral virtues. And we'll talk about what, what we mean by the mean, um, right? It's, uh, all right. So um, first, let's look at justice. So what is it? Uh, page 4.1. <clears throat> so justice is a habit, a virtue, whereby a human being renders to each his or her due by a constant and perpetual will, Right? Constant and perpetual. It's not just a one-off. Oh, I was really just this time, um, but not the other times. Um, no, but and, and it also it's to give others their due. What is due to the other? It's about the other, right? So we're going to talk about rights. Everybody's about my rights, but justice is about the right of the other, right? Thinking about the other, um, and it's a just and the mean here is, or the ju- is according to equality. So this is about the equality of justice, right? Um, So let's talk about that. uh, What what he gives as the quasi-integral parts. It's a little bit easier than prudence. Prudence has like eight of them, right? So um, here we just have two very basic ones. Two things are required for the perfect act of justice. To do good, that is to render to each their due, and avoid evil. Okay, do good, avoid evil. That's by, actually, principle of basic natural law, right? We know that we ought to do that. So justice is really based on natural law. Um, So we should um, decline evil, uh, preserve the already established equality of justice, right, against sins of commission, whereas uh, doing good versus sins of omission, things I ought to do but not. Now, this has to do the good. What is it? It's based on the use. Okay, here's another, there's a Latin word, I-U-S, or sometimes J-U-S, um, which has to do with rights, right? The claim that the other has on me. Okay, so um, there could be, a, a, it, it, it's based on a justum, which is the good act that's due to the other. So there's something due to the other, and because it's due to them, they have a right and a claim to it. Right. So, what kind of rights do they have? Well, we have we could talk about natural rights, right? These are really what's based on natural law, right? This equality balance set by nature, the right to life, right? Because we're living beings, that's the kind of thing we are. We have this right, um, uh, and and the right of parents to be honored by their children, right? Aquinas says the Ten Commandments really are natural law, right? That God promulgated a second time for us because we got so confused after original sin. So he needed to say, look, here it is again. Um, 
Now, positive conventional rights um, are when people privately or as a group act in accordance with a contract of some kind, some kind of agreement, and um, like a contract between businessmen. You can also we can speak of contract, not in a derogatory way. Obviously, I guess the term better term is covenant, but but there is this between spouses that they you know that they, they come to an agreement. So so I don't you know I don't break this co covenant by then going off with someone else. Because this is something that I, there's, the other has a right to now because I've entered into this relationship with them by right, injustice. So, and then there's also a consent by public agreement set by law. The use gentium, um, we don't have a lot of time for it, but that's the rights of nations, like the Geneva Convention, those basic human rights, right, that are owed, like for the people of Ukraine to have a right to water, you know, and, and not, whatever, anyway. Uh, we'll get into that. But um, so they're, they're a combination of natural and um, positive rights together. Now, so legal justice then, general justice. Um, so we're talking about, oh, I should just mention. So um, the individual, right? A lot of times we're all about my individual rights. But obviously society has, I owe to others, and this is for the sake of the common good, right? Um, the common good, and you have this there on point five. So, uh, so legal justice directs the good of the part, right? Not in a derogatory way, but just as a member, a private citizen, to the good of the whole, the common good. So the community, whether it be a religious community, whether it be my lay fraternity, whether it be my family, uh, or society as a whole, or the church, um, they bear the rights, the intention of the common good. And what is that? The common good is the good that has the potential of being enjoyed by many without being diminished, right? So, for example, peace, right? Now, if I take a piece of pizza, it diminishes it. But if I, if I promote peace, <laughs> another piece, um, then it, it's for the good. It builds up, right? If I share the faith, it doesn't diminish it in me. It, 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 should, it, um, it, it can be shared by all and actually grows but because it's common to all, it's also good for the individual. It's good for me too. All right. So um, particular justice. These are the species, uh, subjective parts in point six there. With, this has to do now with uh, particular uh, individuals or groups. And distributive justice. Uh, now the, the whole society or community or family or whatever, they owe something also to the uh, particular individual. Uh, right, parents uh, to to give to their children, but this the mean here he says is uh, is is uh, in distributive justice is geometric because I may not a, a mother or father may not give to their 14 year old the amount of food um, that they would give to the two year old right because there's different needs or maybe different claims too, um, um, so whereas commutative justice one to one. Right. Um, so um, this worker deserves these wages. Right. There's an equality of justice. So the mean there um, is arithmetic. <laughs> arithmetic. What is it? A equals B. Okay. So um, it's commutative because it involves in a commutative exchange of property. Right. Or not necessarily property, but goods. You know, like I work for you this much, you give me this much as fair wages. Right. We talk about fair trade all the time. So. Um, there we go. So there, there's the whole um, legal justice to the whole community, distributive justice to uh, the community gifts to the individuals, individual or groups to one another, commutative. Now, uh, there are vices contrary to justice, um, injustice in general, which actually affects all of them, and, um, and every vice is, is, is in some way has involved some sort of injustice to God, because obviously it's a sin. Uh, uh, contrary to God, um, but there's also um, against distributive justice. You have the respect of persons. That's the bottom of page four. Um, this is not like good human respect. This is like um, giving uh, something that is really not due. Um, uh, having a, in a yeah in a way, for example, um, he gives the example that um, if you consider. If you promote a, a man or a woman to professorship on account of his or her having sufficient knowledge, you consider them the due cause, not the person, right? This person's qualified. But if in conferring something on someone, you consider in him not the fact 
that what you give them is proportionate or due to that person by their qualifications or based on need, right? We saw the distributive justice can also be based on need, um, helping the weaker in society. But, but rather, if you just simply consider he's this particular man, and he says Peter or Martin. Okay, so he actually... Just, um, so then there is respect of the person, right? Simply because, oh, that's my brother. Or, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously uh, there are there are things we owe to our family members, but but some things like the professorship, you know, should be based on something not simply because he's my relative or my friend or hey, I, I like this person and I'm going to do something good for me. Okay, all right. So because he says if you give him something not for some cause that renders him worthy of it, but simply because he's this person, right? that's the advice of respected persons. And then all these others. Uh, how, sin against commutative justice, right? Uh, murder, obviously, even suicide, um, contrary to the natural law, um, violating actually the rights of God over our lives, who gave us this life, um, as well as the rights of our community, families being devastated by someone who's committed suicide, for example. Uh, obviously, there are psychological issues to it and all of that that can mitigate, uh, uh, but right now we're just talking about kind of objectively speaking. Um, um, there's theft and robbery, what we owe, you know, taking that's not due to us, unjust accusations. We can also sin against community justice by words, backbiting, tail-bearing, calumny, deriding, cursing. Um, and then, of course, we can also cheat others in other ways. All right. So um, the, you have there on your handout, I believe. Um, um, or maybe you don't. Yes, you do. Okay, I'm going to let you read on page five. It's just basically explaining the potential parts of um, justice. These are virtues that are associated with justice, right? Um, religion, like we said. It's not a strict equality of justice, because I can never give back to God everything that I owe him. <laughs> I give my life and everything. Um, but, but there is something that I still need in justice to give, worship and service to God. And then the opposite vices, superstition, sacrilege, irreligion, even perjury, taking God's name, you know, as a part of an oath. Uh, piety, again, with my, it's not strict equality of justice. That's why it's a potential part, a secondary that is under justice, but, but can never be, does it fulfill the exact requirement of strict justice? Because I can't give, no matter whether my parents are good or bad, whatever, they, uh, they gave me life, right? So I can never completely give back to them. So it's the virtue of piety against impiety. Anyway, um, also even things like gratitude, truthfulness, friendliness, liberality, right? They're not strict justice, but there is something uh, kind of a, a, a moral uh, rectitude there of, of giving to others. All right, there on point eight you have, by the way, the two interior acts of the virtue of religion, <laughs> devotion and prayer, right, key. And then the exterior acts doesn't mean without the interior, but they're manifested exteriorly, right? And by adoration, this is page 6.8, right? Adoration, uh, both spiritually and bodily, humbling myself, as St. Dominic did, um, offering external things to God, all right, Ex sacrifice, oblations, tithes, also vows, oaths, divine praise. All right. Now, so virtue then, um, that we talked about with justice, it has really to do with this kind of a equality of justice, right? Although it can be also giving to uh, the common good, the common good distributing among members for certain good reasons. But but really here he says now, when we're talking about the passions, the emotional responses, then virtue is like a middle ground, right? Having not excessive, like excessive sorrow, excessive anger, or, and not defective either, right? That I have like no feeling at all, or don't care. Um, so it establishes this mean between the passions. So fortitude then. Fortitude, um, but if you actually, if you look at point 10 um, first, he says the human will is hindered in two ways from following the rectitude of reason. First, through being drawn by some object of pleasure to something other than what uh, the rightness of reason requires, right, to go beyond, uh, this obstacle can be removed by the virtue of temperance. Second, though, through the will being disinclined to follow that which is in accordance with reason on account of some difficulty, right? Suddenly I realize, oh, this is a mammoth task. Ah, oh, what did I get myself into? Giving a talk for Dominicans. Oh my gosh. Um, so, um, so this is, uh, requires a little bit of fortitude, right? 
Um, and um, so that overcomes and removes this very, well, he said it gives an example, like fortitude of the body, those weightlifters, you know, overcomes and, ob- and removes bodical, bodily uh, obstacles. So also fortitude then uh, in the spiritual life, you know, helps us to overcome the, uh, or moderate, actually, because uh, it's, it's natural, he says, to have some fear, right? If we were completely fearless, that would be very bad also. Because um, then we'd be rash and like, do some of these crazy things that people do and get killed. Um, so fortitude is about moderating these passions of fear and daring. So um, so it, there is a kind of a rational mean, I should say, and you can read that on point one. Um, moderating fear according to reason, as opposed to actually... The excess he calls timidity, which we kind of use the term differently these days, but what he means is excessive fear um, versus fearlessness, which he says is also a vice because in there, one does not fear what he ought to fear, right? Um, And then daring, so fear has to do with withdrawing from something I consider evil. Daring has to do with attacking an evil, right? So you see someone about to commit a horrible crime or maybe rape or something like that, you, you might be afraid that that person could harm you, but but, uh, but you out of fortitude, you go and try to stop that evil, right? So you attack. Um, so, um, but it can be excessive with too much daring or precipitousness, rashness, um, or the defect is actually pretty much the same as timidity is the excessive fear. Okay, so there are two acts, though, he says, to, uh, to the virtue of fortitude, right? To be able to, and, and surprisingly, we often think of it simply as attacking. But actually, he says the first and primary act is to endure evil, right? This is the fortitude of the martyrs. To, now, obviously, you don't endure it just for itself, uh, for, the, for its own sake. You do it uh, for, for a higher good, right? For the good of uh, God, for the witness of the faith, or whatever it might be. But, but um, or sometimes it may be also just daily difficulties, but which require virtues of patience and perseverance. All right. Now, I gave you both quasi integral parts and potential parts because the thing is here, they're pretty much the same, um, <laughs> except he adds uh, slight differences there in the second uh, act. Um, but basically, to, to be able to endure in patience, not to fall into sadness. Actually, patience is about sadness. Um, not to excessively uh, like allow sadness to weigh me down so much that I it rather you know, but rather to endure it with a willing spirit, all right, for the good. Um, perseverance to keep going when the going gets tough, the tough get going, um, and, right? <laughs> and then we have potential parts, right? A constancy, right? And also, kind of standing firm. All right, so um, so we have. Um, now the secondary, the second act is is uh, is uh, well. This has to do with an act. He calls it aggression, but he means obviously a good kind of aggression. that's against evil, right? If you think of Christ cleansing the temple, perhaps, or or like I said, attacking someone who is evil. Um, so here he says there are two things required on page eight point four. The first pertains to a preparation of the mind to have our minds ready to attack. And now here he's talking about, he's going to cite Tully, uh, Tully is Cicero, um, mentions confidence, all right, when he says that this mind is much assured and firmly hopeful in great and honorable undertakings, right? So we're talking about great and honorable undertakings, which you don't normally think of as an attack, but here um, it can be used in the sense of, uh, for example, uh, say there's um a plague in the city and we need a new hospital and someone uh, this is where the Richard Magnificence comes in too, someone has the funds and they're willing to use those and go to the great expense and the great difficulty and planning and all of this administration to, to build this hospital uh, right? to, to, to combat the evil of, of you know, people out there just dying in the streets um, okay um, or, and then we have potential parts, magnanimity and magnificence. Uh, so he talks about uh, magnanimity there, um, uh, the bottom of page, uh, sorry, point four there. He says, well, he says here it's the same as great as confidence as to great honors. But if you look in this chart, it gives another uh, a, a better definition, I think, kind of a greatness of soul, right? Animus or anima. Uh, soul, 
among them. Um, and then uh, as opposed to the excess, by excess here, I don't mean excess of virtue, but excess in, in some other passion, uh, presumption, ambition, vainglory, wanting to do, because uh, disordered desire for excellence, like pride, or, or uh, thinking I can go beyond what I can actually do. Um, and versus also the defect and pusillanimity, right? A smallness of soul. Oh, that's too big. For, that's too much for me. I can't do it. Uh, you know, just any anything. Um, we need to be, have the right virtue in between, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and then you have there also. I mentioned patience moderates the passion of sorrow that can come to us due to some hardship or toil. The excess being depression, a lack, total coldness. <laughs> Um, perseverance moderates fear of weariness, a failure to uh, account for maybe the length of time. Always took a lot longer than I thought. Um, per- tenacity, though, would be stubbornness, right? Uh, I-, I ought not to be doing this, but I just keep going. Or malicious, which is a funny thing, but he, he talks about this weakness, effeminacy, in the sense of, I, also, I think of King Herod, right? You know, because he was, you know, having her, you know, Herodias as his wife, and then the girl dances for him, and he's like, so, oh, you know, and then he, he, even though he didn't want to kill John the Baptist, he gives in, yeah. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that's exactly right, but that's how I think of it. Um, so anyway, then we have, um, uh, by the way, magnanimity uh, is not opposed to uh, humility. Um, which we're going to talk about actually under temperance, which is interesting. So magnanimity is under fortitude. Humility comes under temperance because humility is about uh, moderating the desire for excellence. But he says the two are not opposed, right? So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so temperance, what is it? So if you go to page 9, and you can read the other descriptions on your own, but um, first he says, point 1, nature inclines everything to whatever is becoming to it, whatever is fitting to that kind of thing that it is, its nature. So the human being naturally desires pleasures that are becoming to him, right? That's part of our nature, we naturally desire pleasure. That are, but those that are becoming to us as fitting, because we are a rational being, so it follows that those pleasures that are becoming to man should be in accordance with reason. So temperance does not withdraw him, from such pleasures that are in accordance with reason, but only from those pleasures that are contrary to reason. Therefore, it is clear that temperance is not contrary to the inclination of human nature. We are naturally inclined to the good. God made us that way. But is in accord with it. It is, however, contrary to the inclination of the nature of beasts. That is not subject to reason, right? Because sometimes, you know, we even talk about Oh, he acted like a beast last night, right? You know, because he was just, you know, totally drunk or, 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 you know, various other things. We can act, we can lower ourselves and degrade ourselves in our human dignity if we're not careful. So we, we, we should, we, we are rational animals. We need to act that way. So act according to what we are. So, um, so our animality, though, is not something separate from our reason, right? We have those sensitive powers and passions, emotional responses. But they simply need to be guided and elevated by grace after the fall. Um, they require the assistance and guidance of reason to be rightly ordered. So the goal of virtue is not to quash passion or emotions, but rather to guide it you know, towards the virtuous expression in the person's pursuit of his own perfection or true fulfillment. Okay, so he says here again, the object of temperance is a good in respect to those pleasures, particularly con- with respect to those that have to do with the concupiscence of touch. Now, concupiscence, he means here just simply desire. It can be good or bad. It's not yet the sin of concupiscence, right? Which would be only for something that's, that's evil. All right. So, um, again, there's that rational mean uh, that we have to find in that passion of moderating the desire for pleasure, which is the vir- virtue of temperance helps us to do. Excess would be intemperance, excessive desire for pleasure. Defect would be a total insensitivity or insensibility, right? Rejection of all pleasures, aversion to all. Um, which he says is also a vice. So, integral parts uh, of uh, temperance. Um, basically, okay, so I gave you all three here. Integral parts, what makes it up? What's it composed of? 
which interestingly is both shame and honor. I, if you, I think that's the right translation for honestas. But it, uh, it has to do with a kind of respectability, or he said, it speaks about a spiritual beauty. Um, but also, it's good that sometimes we feel shame when we what we do is disordered, because that helps us know that it was wrong. Um, and that we've overstepped the boundary of what was moderate or temperate behavior. Um, and honor, of course, uh, in the good sense, right? He says um, it, it, that loving the beauty of temperance, temperance more than any other virtue, lays claim to a certain decorum, right? Whereas the vices of intemperance excel others in disgrace. So then if you look at the middle column, the subjective parts, these have to do with, he says, two kinds of pleasures of touch. But he, he's also speaking about nourishment, uh, which uh, I guess scientifically we have taste buds, so they do touch. But, um, so, but the, we have to look at the rule of reason with respect to food, right? Because virtue, abstinence is a virtue that moderates that desire for the pleasure of food against the vice of gluttony. Um, sobriety moderates the desire for alcoholic drink against the vice of drunkenness. Uh, so the virtue, and, and then there are also potential parts of virtues on their own. With regard to the other kinds of pleasures, so there's basically two kinds, nourishment and the generative power, the power to procreate, right? So chastity moderates the desire for the act of sexual intercourse itself. Purity moderates the desire for other acts surrounding that, like kissing. Well, but besides those, he, that's where he throws in also the potential parts of humility, meekness, clemency, and studiousness. <clears throat> And we'll just quickly, um, so point four, I'll let you read, please do read, it's the rule of reason that explains on page 10 that what makes it appropriate to consume food, right, in, in the right way, so, uh, sustaining our life, our health, etc., but also enjoying company of others. Um, but, um, and the potential parts, I'll let you read there on page 11, regarding clemency and humility. If you just last thing, look at point eight. Humility restrains the appetite from aiming at great things against reason. Um, disordered, like, which would become uh, pride. Uh, where, and magnanimity urges the mind to great things in accord with right reason, right? For love of God, I do this act. But he says magnanimity is not opposed to humility, but rather that each acts according to the right reason, right? So they're both important. All right, and there you have the vices. And on the last page, you have all of the potential parts, the other sub-virtues, not really sub, but subordinate, you could say in a sense, um, to the carnal virtues, um, what's under each. And then the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I just gave you because, obviously, we can't do this on our own. So we, we pray to the Holy Spirit to give us actualize, we have the gifts for, with grace, but we actualize them in us to help us with these virtues. And except the only thing is, they're almost one to one, except he gives two for faith, and which means he's short one, so a gift of the fear of the Lord goes for both hope and temperance. Okay. Thank you.